trust you have your Bibles this evening. We'll find our way back in Romans chapter, Romans chapter 8. Like I said this morning, we started in Romans 8. We were looking in Romans chapter 8 three, four, or five weeks ago. We stayed in there for a couple of weeks, then we kind of branched off. Now we find our way back into Romans chapter 8. Okay, so here we are in Romans chapter 8. Paul is in his letter to the Romans has got to a point where he's talking about the suffering of the believer while here on earth, as well as the future glory that awaits the believer in Christ. And how this suffering that we experience here on earth has nothing in comparison to what will be revealed to us the day we breathe our last breath and are in the presence of a holy, righteous God. Remember from this morning in Romans chapter 8 verse 17, what did Paul say in Romans 8 17? That door does not want to stay open. In Romans 8 17 it says this, And if children then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now remember this morning we found ourselves branching off from Romans chapter 8 verse 17 and 18 that took us to John chapter 16 where Paul, where not Paul, where the Lord Jesus was saying what? He talked about in this world you will suffer, right? And we know that those that live godly in this world shall suffer persecution. That's just the reality of it. Those that live godly will never escape from that. You will suffer persecution. And the Lord Jesus in Romans 17 talked about how he, how he prayed for the believers, His disciples, as He would lead them in this unbelieving world and He knew they would be experiencing suffering and He prayed to His Father that they could make it through it because in and of themselves they had no chance to do that. Right? He would leave them with what? A comforter. The comforter would be who? The Holy Spirit to help them through their time of suffering. Anything different today? No. You and I have the Holy Spirit living in us when we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that leads and guides and directs us into salvation. And He's the one that comforts us all the way through our service for Christ Himself. But the suffering that we experience, Paul is saying, and if anybody could relate to suffering before I move on, if anybody could relate to suffering, it would have been Paul, right? I mean, what better guy to write up? And I'm not knocking any of the other believers in Scripture that went through horrific conditions. No doubt many did. All the disciples except one, okay, were martyred. One was sent to the Isle of Patmos, okay, well, one of them was a traitor. But you know where I'm going with this. They, so many people up to this point suffered much persecution for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we do know Paul to the Corinthians talked about his own suffering, his shipwreck, his beatings, his, his stripes that he took upon his back in Galatians chapter 6 verse 17. Remember that. When he talked about the suffering marks that he took, when he talked to the Galatians in the letter to the Galatians, the suffering marks in, Roman, in, in Galatians chapter 6 verse 17, where he, where he said, you know what, you want to see evidence of my service, here's my evidence, and he said, look at the scars all over my body. It's the scars of suffering for who? Suffering for Paul? No, it's the scars of suffering for Christ. So if anybody had a good insight in suffering, humanly speaking, it would have been him. No doubt. Yet we suffer not for nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed to us later, he says in verse 18 of Romans chapter 8. Affliction is part of being a believer in a lost and dying world that doesn't like you. They don't like you, okay? They don't want you. And as time moves on, as we come to the end of, if you will, the return of Christ, these things will, will, will grow more and more. Time will become more and more evil. 
when the Lord God turns over society, the society turns more and more evil. You see that in Scripture. You see it with Israel. You see it in Romans chapter 1. I think we mentioned that this morning. When a society is turned over, it will grow more and more evil. It will grow more and more against Christ. And you're living that today. You're living that. You don't see much of it in the area in which you live and in these valleys and everything because everybody's still pretty much carrying the banner of Christian, whether it's truly of the faith or not. But you really pick it up as you leave this area. We've talked about it in the past. And as you enter into the cities, things of uh, areas that, that they have no desire for the things of Christ, the suffering intenses, intensifies dramatically. Now, Paul, if you turn to... If you turn to Turn in your, in your Bible here. We'll find our place into uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3, verse 10. Something very familiar in 2 Timothy 3, 10. We'll move there and see what Paul has to say to Timothy about suffering. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, listen to what he says. But that has fully known my doctor, my man of manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering charity. He says, you, you know all about me. Certainly, Paul, certainly, Timothy, you know what I teach. Certainly, Timothy, you know how I live. Certainly, Timothy, you know my purpose in life and what it is. You've fully known my doctrine. you know what I've taught. Whether people liked it or not, they knew what was going to come out of Paul's mouth. Most definitely he ruffled feathers. Why? Because of what he taught. It lined up with the will of Christ. He spoke the will of Christ. As the Spirit of God led God and directed him. You know who I am, Timothy. You know my life's example when it comes to serving Christ. You know my manner of life. You know my purpose in life is what he's saying. My faith, my patience or long-suffering, my love, my endurance. Timothy, you know these things. You've walked with me. You've served with me. These things were not up for debate. You stood beside me in the faith of Christ. But listen to what he says in verse 11. You know how much persecution and afflictions came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured. But out of all of them, the Lord God did what? Delivered me. Paul to Timothy is doing what? Timothy, if you live the way I've lived, now Paul is not tooting his horn by no means, but Timothy, if you live the godly life that you're called to live, they're going to come at you, young man. They're not going to like what you have to say. They're going to come at you with everything they've got to try to trip you up, to, to try to get you to doubt, to try to trouble you. They're going to try your patience. They're going to try your love. They're going to try your faith. They're going to try you. They're going to, they're going to make you question if it's all worth it. Have you ever been there? They're going to make you question yourself, Timothy. Why? Because what they want, they know they cannot touch your faith directly. But if they can just get you, Timothy, if they can just get you, Timothy, in your suffering to say, I've had it, I give up. They win, you lose. 
right? Is that not what he's telling him? They win, you lose. Now, they don't win. Ultimately, you're still saved, Timothy. But, oh, your service for Christ, when you throw it in, it dramatically decreases, doesn't it? Now, listen to what he says. Persecutions and afflictions had come my way, which came unto me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured. All the persecutions I endured. How? How in the world did he endure such persecution? What did he endure? Remember the beatings. The beatings. What, 40 stripes minus one so they wouldn't break the law? Leaving him for dead? I mean, the poor guy, years into his ministry, he could, he could hardly walk straight. His body was badly beaten. It would never be the same. But he didn't care about his body. Did he? What did he care about? To see that he did the will of his Savior. To see that he did his will. Why in the world do you think that the next chapter in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I have fought the fight. You can never accuse me of throwing in the towel. You can never accuse me of walking away. I fought the fight. I've kept the faith. Listen to what he says at the end of verse 11. I endured this, but out of them all the Lord God, He's the one who delivered me. His faith was rewarded. He delivered me. He delivered me. When it comes time to proclaim hard truth to the listening ears, Timothy, whether they wanted to hear it or not, whether they could accept it or not, I gave it to them. Because it was for their spiritual better. And I knew that through it all, through it all, that it would be the Lord Christ, the Lord Jesus, who would what? Deliver me. You remember that. We've said it before. There will be times in your life and your service for Christ where you're going to have to realize that He is the only one that will get you through it. Even in your times of not service for Christ and everyday living, He is the only one that will get you through certain aspects of your life. As a believer, you won't do it on your own. It will only come through Christ and Christ alone. Listen to what he says in verse 12, Timothy. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. What's he saying? He said, listen, Timothy. He said, this, this is a promise, Timothy. You choose to live godly in this world, Timothy. You will suffer. You will suffer. Timothy. This is, are these encouraging words? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I mean, by this point, you're thinking to yourself, okay, if you read the beginning of the last two letters of Timothy, you think, oh, my goodness, Paul. I mean, but he's given the truth, isn't he? You see, it's for, what, how would it, would, would it have benefited Timmy, Timothy? Anything spiritually speaking to not give him deep truth, to not give him the truth, to not warn him of what was coming, would it, would it have benefited him any spiritually speaking if, if Paul would have kept his mouth shut and just said, well, you know, I don't want to give it to him because he can't really handle it and blah, blah, blah. It's just not going to... It would have done him no good. He would have crashed and burned in the ministry. He would have crashed and burned. Sometimes when you talk to family members and when you talk to friends, 
It's hard sometimes to give them Scripture, isn't it? It's hard. Because you know, a lot of times, what you're about to get the, give them, they're not going to like. They're not going to like. But you know it's for their spiritual better. You know that. And in here, Paul knew it was for Timothy's spiritual better because he knew. Timothy seen the suffering. By this point, he's experienced some of it. Paul and his reminder, those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. What's going to happen, Timothy? Let me tell you what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. Evil men, Timothy, seducers, will wax worse and worse. It's not going to get any easier, Timothy. It's actually going to become very difficult. This is pretty much the deterioration of a society. <laughs> it doesn't get any easier. They'll be deceiving and they'll be deceived. Sin's deceptive power. The deceivers will be deceived and they will be deceiving. <coughs> For some of them, they will think they're doing right when all along they're doing wrong. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. What is he saying? Timothy, you must remain faithful. <coughs> you must be faithful. Faithful to what? Faithful to what has been taught to you. Faithful to the one who's taught it to you. You can trust those who taught it to you. You can trust them, Timothy. Why these words? Because suffering is in every believer's life. It's kind of ingrained in their Christian DNA, if you will. <coughs> every believer will experience this suffering. Some on a level far grander, far greater than others. But every one of us go through without a doubt. And then he hits them with this, and this is, but continue thou in the things learned, which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, that from a child you've known the Holy Scriptures. You see, Paul is about to tell Timothy the value of understanding Scripture. The value of knowing the Word of God. There's great value of understanding Scripture. There's great value of knowing Scripture. You know, it's one thing to know Scripture. But there's great value in knowing Scripture. For the believer. From a child, you've known the Holy Scriptures. From a child? Yeah, from a child. Timothy, your grandmother and your mother taught you the Scriptures. Now when you were a child, you didn't realize everything that you were taught would someday be used in the ministry for Jesus Christ. Because the Scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture will be given by inspiration of God, it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correcting for instruction in righteousness. What is he reminding Timothy about now? He's saying, Timothy, Scripture, you will, lose, you will use Scripture in your ministry to correct those who need to be corrected. You will use Scripture in your ministry, Timothy, to teach those who need to be taught. 
Timothy, your opinion has no place in Scripture. Right? Man's opinion has no place behind the pulpit. Man might give an insight or an analogy or something like that, but you know where Paul's going with this. He's emphasizing what to Timothy? In suffering. In suffering. One of the greatest assets Timothy will have will be Scripture. It'll be just that. And in your life and in my life, in suffering, one of the greatest assets you have, and I have, <clears throat> is Scripture. It's the Word of God. Paul's reminding Timothy these very truths. <coughs> now back to uh, Romans chapter 8. He's constantly emphasizing <clears throat> suffering in the last two verses and the glory that awaits <clears throat> the believer in Christ. And there's other passages in Scripture, and I'm going to read one really quick, and that goes along with the same theme of where we are at here this evening in Romans chapter 8, verse 17 and, and 18. <clears throat> the other passage of Scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4. <clears throat> Verse 1. <clears throat> Man. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Paul saying this, God in His mercy to the Corinthian church has given us a ministry. And in this ministry, may we never give up. May we never give up. This is what he means by, therefore we're seeing we have this ministry. We have received mercy. We faint not. We don't give up. Give up from what? Why give up? Because the suffering will be intense. It will be intense. But have rejected or renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitful, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. In other words, it's good news in verse 3, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. We don't use shameful deeds. We don't use underhanded methods is what he's saying about craftiness. We just deliver the Word of God. We don't fine-tune it in some pragmatic way so that people can respond Paul said, no, we don't use craftiness. We don't mishandle the Word of God deceitfully. We don't distort it. I'm not here to trick anyone. But what I am here to do is just to speak truthful about God, about Christ, about His Word. And then he says in verse 3, if the good news we preach it's hidden behind a what? Our gospel will be hid, it is hidden to them that are lost. The good news we preach is hidden behind a veil. Basically, simply put, it's the Lord's will to hide it from people that are perishing. Wow. Wow. Now listen as he says as we move down. He gets into the suffering. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the eyes of them, the eyes of them which believe not, lest the light of the gospel, the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commandeth the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthly vessels, that the excellency and power may be of God and not of ourselves. 
We will be troubled. We are troubled on every side. We are pressed on every side. You will be persecuted on every side. But you will never be crushed. Yet not distressed, we are perplexed, but not in despair. What's Paul saying to the Corinthians? The same thing he said to Timothy. The same thing he said in his letter to the Romans. You will be troubled. You will be persecuted. You will suffer. But your dependence must not be on yourself. Your dependence must be on Christ. In Christ alone. You'll be persecuted. But not forsaken. You'll be cast down. But not destroyed. You will do this. For who you are. A believer in Christ. We are just mere earthen vessels back up in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We are just mere earthen vessels. We are like fragile clay jars. Are we not? We're fragile. The Lord God could have used anything to proclaim His good news. But he used a broken, the scarred, the cracked, the beat up. He could have used anybody to proclaim the gospel. But he used a murderer and said, This one's mine. He used the adulterer and said, this one's mine. He used the fornicator and said, this one's mine. He used the homosexual, this one's mine. And on and on and on. Clay jars, cracked vessels. He used Paul, ruthless. Mine. And he can use you, but understand, it comes with suffering. It comes with suffering. There's no easy ministry for Christ. There's no easy ministry. Believe me. There's no easy ministry for Christ. And the pressure gauge tightens up more and more as you grow more in Christ. It just gets tighter and tighter and tighter. To where at times you are pressed on every side by trouble, as he says in verse 8. Every side. He purposely says every side. At first, you're pressed on one side. And then you're pressed on two. But before you know it, you're pressed on every side. And you feel like you're about to explode. But that's suffering for Christ. And Paul gives us that. But he doesn't leave out the fact that through it all, through it all, it's Christ that will what? See you through. It's Christ that will see you through. It's Christ. Jump down to verse 15. For all things are for your sake. That the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many rebound or redound to the glory of God. What's he saying? All this is for your benefit. 
as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. Now how many times have you, as you went through much suffering, thought to yourself, yes, this is for my benefit. That's not human nature, is it? It's not. But Paul says what? For all things are for your sake. For this is for your benefit. God's grace will reach more and more people. There will be great thanksgiving. Through thanksgiving of many. And it will all redound. And it will all be given more glory. More and more glory we go to the Lord God Himself. For which cause we faint not in suffering. In verse 16. For this reason we will never faint. We will keep pushing he says. We will keep pushing and we will never faint. Keep pushing. For the inward man is renewed day in and day out. It's a daily renewing. Isn't it? It's a daily renewing. And then to top it off, Paul, and only the way Paul can present things, for our light affliction, light affliction, Paul. Paul, you could have picked a different set of words. No, no, no. Why no? Because this was inspired by the Spirit of God, right? Light affliction, our present trouble, won't last very long. They don't last long, do they? It's only but for a moment. Your light affliction, your suffering for Christ will only last for a moment when compared to eternity. Just small. They only last for a moment, but yet they work for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of what? Glory. Yet they produce for us a glory that vast outweighs them. A glory that vast outweighs our troubles. A glory that will last forever and ever. Your suffering is but for a moment. It will outweigh the glory will outweigh your suffering for all eternity. What a beautiful shot of encouragement to the suffering church. To those that were in Corinth, and it was a mess, Corinth was, but that were truly trying to live for Christ. Within the church. What, what a beautiful picture. What a shot of encouragement to them. To say listen. This glory. Is an eternal weight of glory. And it will outweigh all your suffering. That you are going through. One ounce of glory. Will outweigh a thousand pounds. Of suffering. Because it's His glory, isn't it? While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For with the things that are seen are temporal. But the things that are not seen are eternal. Don't look at your troubles. Try not to look at your suffering. It's easy to say now. But tomorrow is a different day, isn't it? 
Troubles and suffering are always right around the corner. But try not to, lo try not to look at your troubles. While we look not at things which are seen, but that the things are not seen. Paul says, I'm going to give you a vision. Not like we hear people say today that they've seen a vision or whatever. Nuttiness. Paul's saying this. I want to give you a vision. I want you to look at Christ. I want you to look at the beauty of Christ. I want you to look at the beauty of who He is. Of what He's done. Of what He will do. These things what you see are temporal. Yeah, but Paul, man, look at that scar on you. Your back is scarred up. Your chest is scarred up. It's as if he takes it off and he says, everything on me, the scars, the bruises, it's temporal. It's temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. But who I've served to earn these scars and these bruises. See, what do you mean earn? I mean, ain't that not what he said in Galatians chapter 6, verse 17? He said, you want to talk about something now? You want to, you want to toot each other's horn? Let me just take off my, I'll take my cloak off, okay? I'll check it out. These scars, these bruises were for Christ. The one I cannot see. But the one someday I will see face to face. And though I'm bruised and battered today, the day I'm called home, this bruised and battered body will be no more. You remember that. May I remember that as we serve Christ for His glory, for His honor. And then we'll close at the end, at the beginning of verse 1 of chapter 5 in 2 Corinthians. It just kind of ties in a little bit. For we know, listen to what he says in verse 1, for we know that our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. We have a building of God, a house that met, not made with hands, eternal in heaven. Paul says, listen, when this earthly tent is taken down, when we die and leave this earthly body, there's a house. There's an eternal tent waiting for me. And it's not made with human hands. Why say that? What did Paul do for a living? He was a what? Tent maker. How do you put up a tent? With your hands. My eternal home will not be built with these hands. Only my earthly home. Just think, there was a day. There was a day in Paul's life We're on his journeys for Christ. He put up his what? He put up his last tent. It'll be no more. Let's pray. Our Father, Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you for all that you do and you be glorified and honored. Father God, just teach us your word. Remind us of this suffering, of this service we must endure for you. Lord God, living on this or in this world of unbelief, at times can be overwhelming. 
But we must not look at these things that are temporary. We must look at the things that are eternal. For the things around us are falling apart. But your plan is not. And you never will. We love you. We glorify you. As we open up this business meeting tonight, Lord God, may you be glorified and honored and praised through it. For it's in your name we do give thanks. Amen.